We're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna go run by PETA headquarters so I can review a cool new book that came out today. Ever since I read Love Works a few years ago, I have wanted to work for Hirsch and Family Entertainment. Now that is the company that owns Dollywood and Silver Dollar City. Um, Love Works was written by Joel Manby, the CEO of Hirsch and at the time. Um, and he is in the top 10 of amusement industry titans that I'd want to have dinner with. Probably right under Dolly Parton, but right above uh, Alan Shilke. So, uh, Love Works was re-released March 17th, and it includes like three extra really interesting chapters that chronicle um, Joel Mamby's move from Hershend to SeaWorld and he became the CEO of SeaWorld at the exact same time that they were fighting PETA um, during the Blackfish controversy. Now why would Joel Mamby leave Hershend to go to SeaWorld during this time? Um, he doesn't give too much of an explanation but he does say that he accomplished all his goals he wanted to at Hershend, um, primarily showing how love as an action can work in a company. Um, and he wanted to try that in a new environment with new challenges. And in hindsight, it's pretty clear that Joel Mamby was not prepared for the enormity of the challenges he would face at SeaWorld. Not only was the business side of things tanking, but as soon as he got announced as CEO, the personal attacks from PETA started really ramping up. So much so that he had to have cops stationed at his driveway for his own family's protection. But putting all the personal problems aside, Joel Mamby focused on the business problems at hand. And all those problems, as we all know now, stemmed from the Blackfish documentary and the changing public sentiment about keeping orcas in captivity. The orca, or Shamu shows and images, had always been the main part of SeaWorld's brand. And now, in the span of a few months, the images associated with that went from driving business to the brand to being one of the biggest brand liabilities. There were protesters at the parks, protesters all over the internet, and attendance was dropping, not just at SeaWorld parks, but at bush parks and at places associated with the Sesame Street brand, and this was so bad that Sesame Street threatened to break all ties with Bush, and this was something they could do at the time because their contract was coming up for renegotiation. So, this was the scene when Joel Mamby stepped in as CEO. And this is the first object lesson that he wants us to learn about love in action. So he says that when he first got to the company, they viewed all these animal activists as the enemy. You were either with SeaWorld or you were, or you were against them and a threat. But Joel Mamby was presented with the opportunity to bridge the gap between both sides. When one of his friends introduced him to the CEO of the Humane Society of the United States, now at that time, the, the executives at SeaWorld didn't want Joel Mamby to meet with anyone from the Humane Society, and the executives from the Humane Society didn't want their CEO meeting with anyone from SeaWorld. Both companies thought it would be bad for them. But the two CEOs met anyway, in a secret meeting in Washington, D.C. They put their egos aside, found goals they had in common, and developed a plan that would benefit both companies. SeaWorld would agree to continue funding animal welfare projects on a massive level and all orca breeding and transition orca shows to a more natural show. And they would transition their food options to cage-free eggs and more organic and animal-friendly options. SeaWorld would also team up with the Humane Society to stop shark finning, stop the clubbing deaths of young seals for fur, and work in many other ways to end animal cruelty. And in exchange, the Humane Society would publicly support SeaWorld as a worthwhile family destination. So Joel Mamby presented this plan to the SeaWorld board, along with some market testing about the orcas and the, the Shamu brand. And remarkably, they agreed. Um, even though this meeting had started in secret, it was now public and had the full backing of the board. Likewise, the CEO of the Humane Society brought it to his board, they agreed with the plan, and then they had a joint announcement, and after that announcement, SeaWorld stocks went up, and trust in the SeaWorld brand skyrocketed. But SeaWorld, and to a greater extent Joel Mamby, weren't in the clear just yet. Even though the public opinion went up, the attendance numbers hadn't reflected that yet. 
SeaWorld Texas started showing a slight attendance increase in the year 2017. But 2017 was still worse financially for the company than 2016. And this is when Joe Mamby was facing his greatest personal struggles within the company. You see, there was this activist investor in SeaWorld that the book references by the fake name of Frank. Now Frank, even though he was supportive of the decision to end the orca breeding program, proceeded later on in the year to undermine Joel Mamby. According to the book, Frank would negotiate new deals without Joel Mamby's knowledge or approval. He would also go to Joel Mamby's direct reports and give them conflicting information and direction as to what they're supposed to do. Now apparently this went on long enough and frustrated Joel Mamby enough that he went to Sam, another fake name, who is the chairman of the board at SeaWorld. Joel Mamby came to Sam and asked him to intervene, um, basically to ensure that Frank would stay in his lane and allow Joel to do his job as CEO. Joel Mamby thought that Frank's decisions were putting immediate profit ahead of the long-term health of the SeaWorld company. Unfortunately, Sam also was valuing immediate profit as the company that he represented was in a lot of debt at the time, and they needed to raise the value of SeaWorld stock as soon as possible. So Sam's response to Joel Mamby was basically that Frank is who he is, and that you have to get used to it and get used to working with him in the current way. And this is when the drama really gets going. Joel Mamby tells Sam that if that's how it's going to be, then he does plan on leaving the company. He does say that he will stay and help them uh, transition the company to a new CEO. But Sam goes and tells Frank what happened. Frank gets very angry that Joel Mamby doesn't like how he runs things. So Frank and Sam decide that it will be best if Joel Mamby leaves immediately and doesn't wait for the transition period. So in effect, Joel Mamby gets fired. SeaWorld goes without a CEO for a long time. They get a new interim CEO who then quits because of the way they run the company. And the book never says, and I still don't know if SeaWorld's in a stable situation now. Now anyway, uh, back to the Joel Mamby part. So career-wise, the narrative of this book ends on a huge downer. I mean, Joel Mamby literally gets fired at the end. But it makes for a much more impactful book because it shows his ideas actually get challenged and tested. The whole 90% of the book that takes place at Hershend, he's in a system that rewards treating your employees with love and respect. And by going to SeaWorld, where it's just chaos and there's internal and external pressure to just get mean and calloused and angry, um, it shows how, how those philosophies of love work and how occasionally they don't. When all is said and done, these last few chapters are a fascinating glimpse at a CEO who's desperately trying to adhere to his philosophy of love in a place where that seems almost impossible. Um, I'll leave you with, the la with some of the lines of the book that stuck with me the most, um, where Joel Mamby writes, I will have a hard time forgiving PETA for protesting outside my home, frightening my son, and being untruthful in their attacks on SeaWorld and SeaWorld's employees. I, I want to forgive, and I think I will eventually, but I will probably never forget what they did. <laughs>